Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Facebook Live. I guess I'll move over here to help show the words a bit better. Uh, today, I um, hope you like my sweater. Christmas is coming, so I thought I'd show off some of my Christmas sweaters. Today, I wanted to uh, go over the Merck Animal Health Survey. Now, I posted the link to this white paper on my Facebook page. Um, I also have on my blog post at drsallyjfoot.com, um, like what I'm gonna talk about today, I've blogged about this and I have the link to this also in my blog post and uh, that. I became aware of this, I didn't know this survey was being run until I was talking to um, a veterinary publisher, uh, you know, magazine publication for veterinary practices that I'm gonna be looking at doing some writing for and the um, editor brought up, yeah, I think our topic for next year really needs to be focused on behavior considering the results of the Merck survey that was just published, just released. And I said, I hadn't seen it. So I looked it up and um, that's why I'm here today with this Facebook Live to go over the results because it's really, it's really pretty, uh, it's a good warning for what's coming up with uh, these new dog owners and, and I really want to look at this in a proactive way, okay? I don't want to only be like, oh my gosh, it's all gloom and doom. I want to say, okay, things, we're having, some, we're having problems. And anybody, any one of you who is a general veteran, practice veterinarian, a technician, an assistant, a doggy daycare operator, dog trainer, I think you're all, and pet owners, dog owners, we're all pretty much aware of the kind of mismatch from some people who are new dog owners on what a dog needs and the expectations of dog ownership and what really this is, you know, what it's really like to have a dog. And so Merck, um, which is a major drug company, ran this survey back uh, from like in October for about two weeks and then they published the results. So um, the striking results, I'm not gonna read the whole survey, uh, but I am gonna go over the high points here. So the first one is this, it said, you know, while many people found comfort during the COVID-19 pandemic by bringing home new dogs and companionship, the survey found 73% of those who became dog owners for the first time this year have considered rehoming the dog once the pandemic ends. Now, becoming a new dog owner, this could include people who purchased a dog, bought a purebred dog, or you know, purchased or adopted a dog from an individual, like maybe you know, just a mistake mating. But it also includes the clearing of the shelters that went on the spring, with you know the adoptions out of the shelters, or whenever shelters may have reinstituted or restarted adoptions, and the rescues and foster homes. So 73% of new dog owners are have thought about giving that dog up which may be in the next six months, now that the vaccine has just been released in Britain and will be coming here in the United States within, within literally weeks to uh, you know, protect our first line workers. And it's go, you know, the vaccine is going to roll out, which means we're gonna get some control over this pandemic. So we're gonna be looking at 2021 as a year for very high risk of one-year-old to two-year-old dog surrenders going back to shelters or rehoming or whatever, unless we take some of the steps I'm gonna cover at the end of this, okay? But 73% have thought about getting rid of this dog. It's really important for us all to be aware of that. Um, now, what it said here was, this is likely driven by a lack of knowledge about what it takes to care for a pet. As one in four, 25% claim they didn't have enough information to know how to properly care for their dog. And I'd say, yeah, that's probably pretty true. Why, as a veterinarian in general practice, I would oftentimes see uh, people may have adopted a young dog from the shelter, or maybe they, maybe they even purchased a purebred puppy. And what information they received right there at the time of the purchase of the puppy or adoption of the puppy was really variable. It depended on how big that rescue or shelter was, how prepared, you know, how much. You know, like how well um, organized were they for the information of now, this is the time for the next, say, vaccination. These, this is information on house training. This is information on how to get your dog to like walking on a leash, how to get, you know, how to expend the energy on your young puppy. Here's puppy class. You know, here are what we have in our community. It was all across the board. 
So depending on where this family, how they got that young dog, especially a puppy, many of them really didn't have any information unless, until we were giving it to them. And now we've got to deliver it <laughs> during a 15, I would make my puppy exams longer. My puppy exams are at least 30 minutes, maybe 45, to really cover everything. I was very proactive, you know me. Yet in many other practices, and especially if that puppy's going to a vaccination clinic. If you're using a vaccination clinic like at Petco or wherever, they have to go through like 10 vaccine appointments to 15 vaccine appointments an hour. They don't have the time to go over this. That's not the place where you're going to get it. So many of these dogs, I think, are falling through the cracks. And for that, then we have owners who are left going, I don't know what to do. And if they go on Google, they do a Google search, you know they're going to get a whole smattering of information. All right, so one in four felt they didn't have enough. 25% felt I don't, I don't didn't know enough for what I should do. Now it said that 58% um, said that they wished taking care of their pet's health didn't take so much time. And then a third uh, were surprised to how much, how much it cost to care for their pets. So again, preparation for the new dog owner just wasn't really happening, you know, and, and that's, that's just how it is. I don't know what to say to that. Okay, um, now a good thing is that 70% of all dog owners would like to learn new ways to keep their dogs healthy. So they are invested in wanting to maintain good health for their dog. Okay, they wanted to take less time and they wanted to take cost less money, but they do want to do it. And again, I'm going to give some suggestions on how we can help make the delivery, not only of veterinary care, but preventative home health care, what the client can do at home on a regular basis for preventing problems or managing problems that then it will not take tons of time and will not cost tons of money for them. And then how they, we can prepare them if it's something might be costly, you know, and, and at least give them some idea on um, what to expect and even some resources for that. Okay, sorry, that was page one and two. Uh, now then, the puppies, ah, so here we go. Um, yep, so the biggest thing was more than one third of our puppy owners, pandemic puppy owners, said they were surprised by how much attention the pet requires. And I think that what, I've, what I'm seeing between behavior consults that I'm providing, people inquiring about behavior consults, especially when referred by the veterinarian, uh, and even just some comments. I was on, on a call yesterday with a colleague of mine, a veterinary uh, practice, general practice, and the veterinarian commented, oh, we're going to have such a problem with one-year-old dogs next year. I can count in the last two weeks, I've seen at least six corgi puppies, for whatever reason, the corgi is becoming a very popular puppy breed. At least six corgi puppies who have not been to any kind of puppy class, they haven't followed any socialization recommendations or online things from you, and they're, you know, they're nipping and they're jumping, and as an adult dog, they're really going to be a problem. And so these are new puppy owners. They have time. Maybe they've wanted to get a puppy. And now that they have the time to have a puppy, like, oh, let's get a puppy. But again, they're not prepared. Let's go back to the first comment. Uh, and, and that. So, and then there additionally, one third of the people who became dog owners for the first time during the pandemic are reconsidering, are considering rehoming their dog because of the high energy demand. So the high energy demand on this newly acquired dog is for the puppy owner, the puppy owner is complaining about this, as well as any other new dog owner. So a new dog owner would be the person who adopted the dog from the shelter. And we know 48% of the dogs that are in the shelter are six months of age to three years of age. And they weigh over 50 pounds. So it's pretty likely now, of course, this survey doesn't have all that breakdown, but if we start to pull together what we know from you know, the industry and other studies, 48% of our dogs are over 50 pounds and maybe between six months of age to three years of age in the shelter. Well, if we clear out the shelter, that means a lot of people have now adopted this young, kind of 
adolescent to young adult dog who is high energy, being a large breed dog, they are going to require longer walks, more intense aerobic activity as compared to the 10 pound Yorkshire Terrier. And if, that, and if this is a first time dog owner who now just adopted the Labrador Staffordshire Terrier mix or Labrador Boxer mix and was not told this dog is gonna need a minimum of one hour broken up into three or four 15, 20 minute sessions daily to, to have his energy needs basically met. It might even be higher. If they were not told any of that, they won't be ready to do that. And then we're gonna to start to see dog problems. So the high energy, that's, that's really significant. 38% were surprised about it. 33, a third of these new dog owners, this is the reason why they're gonna rehome. He's too active, he's too much. Okay. All right, um, now a tip on that, okay? As I just said, is yeah, okay, my, my prescription for all adult dogs is a minimum of one minute of walking on a leash off your property. Backyard doesn't count. Walking on a leash off the property per pound of body weight of dog. Got a 60 pound Labrador, that's 60 minutes. We don't have to do 60 minutes at one time. We can break it up into like four or five walks, 15 minutes a piece, 12 minutes a piece, so that we can manage it in our day and actually for the dog, it may even be a little more interesting to have four 15 minute walks a day, each walk going in a slightly different direction. But then we gotta have the human to get in the habit of getting up out of their chair, away from their computer or tablet, putting that leash on and taking the dog out for that 15 minute walk four times a day. But that does help it to be a little bit more simple than thinking, oh my gosh, I have to spend a whole hour walking this dog. But we need to break it down, I think, into a simple way to do it, multiple small walks, and give them a number. You know, give them a number that's realistic. And if they can't do the whole hour, say, you know what? If you get two 15-minute walks, the walk off of the property outside of the backyard is what it helps their brain to settle down. It's really settling for them. It's interesting for them. And that's better than not going out at all. Okay, so we need to find ways of phrasing this to set it up for success. All right, um, the second thing for activity here, food puzzles. If we've got a client or the shelter, somebody calling going, oh my God, this dog is just nuts. He is just all over the place. As people will say, he's a hot mess. That dog should never eat out of a bowl again. All of his food needs to come from simple, short five minute steps for training. He's earning his food that way and food puzzles. And I speak from experience because if you've seen a lot of my videos on my YouTube channel with my dog, Bella, the little black dog, she has not eaten out of a bowl since she was about 10 weeks old. Very highly active dog. She was always inquisitive and in getting into things and using food puzzles for all of her meals, not treats. I mean, she might get a treat once in a while in it, but all of her meals has been the best way to keep her mentally engaged and minimize some of her barking and wanting to get on the shelves, etc. throughout her life. She's 12 years old now, and she still eats all of her food out of food puzzles. And frankly, I also think that has really decreased her brain aging as she's become older. Okay, so food puzzles, walks, break them up into short, frequent chunks through the day. Okay, um, now here's another thing. This really surprised me, but hey, good thing for these surveys, right? One third, 35% of our first time dog owners said that giving their dog flea and tick preventative treatments has been an unexpected hurdle. Uh, ranking this responsibility is even more difficult than housebreaking. Uh, so, you know, in 29% of all pandemic puppy owners, both experienced and first time owners said, they were surprised to learn how much parasites can impact their pet's health. So I guess this really surprises me because I'm old. I mean, I, when I became a veterinarian in 1984, our flea and tick prevention was a bath, a dip, a spray, bomb the house, a flea collar, which is basically ineffective, and a flea powder that also was not very good. In other words, 
you're having to spray your dog every day. You know, fleas and ticks were really difficult to control and, and even your best clients were having to do a lot of work to give your pet like a, a topical, you know, you just put the um, front line, revolution, whatever, on the back of the neck and it lasts an entire month. To me, is this is easy, but gotta listen to the survey results. And I don't, I didn't read the question. The survey is closed now. I couldn't get into it. I don't know. Is it a matter that going back again to I didn't know what to expect? You know, my pet needs for care. I didn't. I wasn't set up to know what to really do. Is it the fact that that the flea and tick preventative typically has to be used every month, not just once and done? Some things like the Soresto collar are kind of like that. You know, the collar's worn, it lasts for months. Bravteco and some of these other oral medications may last up to three months, but all the same, there's some kind of a repeatability that needs to happen with flea and tick protection in order to protect our pets. And then secondly, the diseases, especially our ticks carry. If you're up in the Northeast, Wisconsin also, Wisconsin, Minnesota is another area of, with Lyme's disease. And if you are not maintaining the tick protection or maybe Lyme's vaccination, there's a really big risk of a life-threatening disease to come from the ticks. And if this dog owner was not told straight up, hey, look, you gotta keep up this brav techo. We've gotta keep up this front line. We've gotta keep this up to protect them, not only from just nasty ticks, but also the diseases these carry. Then there's gonna be some disease outbreak and it's gonna be expensive, going back down to this money part, and the client's gonna say, well, I didn't know. I didn't know I was supposed to put it on every month. I didn't realize this. So I think that, this is just my opinion, <clears throat> I think the idea that you have to keep up with something monthly is a bit of a hurdle, and it is. Now we have a lot of choices, and again, I think that's the other thing with a client is if we've sent home something like the Bravteco chewable you know, tablet, whether it's through an email, a text, a phone call, and I know the veterinary practices are really still very busy with the, the curbside care situation has literally increased the phone traffic to these practices four to five fold. So phone calling it may be about the worst way to try to ask this question. Get everybody's cell phone number and text them, hey, how did it go after giving the brow techo? Some dogs do get vomiting and diarrhea. And if the pet got the vomiting and diarrhea, A, maybe they didn't get the full dose, so it's not protective, or B, client's not gonna give the next dose because they're gonna get sick, and then we're gonna have you know breakthrough. So clinics, you can set up, there are different um, programs, automatic programs that you can set up, like how did it go for, like how was the brav techo, like, you know, update, like update me or let me know how this went that can automate it to not add so much work, but it's gonna mean a step up in technology for you. You're gonna to need to embrace some of these software systems or things like this, or maybe have a way that you just tell the client, look, you text me, you email us, okay, would you please do this, whatever. But to get that feedback, get feedback about how was it to use this product? How was it to give this product, okay? That will help with, I think, some of the hurdle, because we have enough choices between topical, you know, liquids that can be applied to the back of the neck, tablets that can be given, collars that can be worn. We're not in those old days like I, when I first started my career with dips and sprays and baths and bombs and you name it. It's a much better world now for flea and tick control. Now here I thought was an interesting number talking again about parasites and how the impact of them, etc. 57% of previous dog owners thought they knew about parasites. They thought they understood and knew how bad worms can be or what kind of worms pets could get, et cetera, et cetera, and then found out, no, they really didn't. And you know, during this pandemic, many people, which is a good thing, okay, they've been going out to the state parks with their dogs for hikes. They've been taking them on more walks, maybe in different parks or on beaches, et cetera, and that's where a lot of these parasites are. They're in the ground, they're in the soil. And it's great to take them out to these places, but that's why you need to keep up on the flea and tick control. So if these past pet owners, and I've heard this so often in my office, well, I didn't see any worms, it doesn't have any worms. <laughs> no, you don't always see the worms. You only see tapeworm when that proglottid passes out of their bottom, dries up and it falls off. Still, in, He still has tapeworms in his body, 
but you only get to see that. Or the round worm that looks like spaghetti, that is passed only when they have a huge amount of round worm in their system, or they were just wormed maybe 12 to 24 hours before, and then you're seeing the dead ones pass, but it doesn't mean they don't have them. We find worms through a test on the stool that examines the specimen under the microscope. These worms and how we determine them are microscopic. What's in the body may be bigger, but you're not gonna see that. So again, really understanding you know, what the worms are, how we determine it, and how they get it. You know, walk, I mean, dogs, it's normal for them to eat dirt. It is normal them, for them to pick up another animal's stool. And that's how they will get worms. And they will not necessarily have diarrhea. They will look a normal way, but you've got to run the stool test and then really help the client, help the client with giving that regular um, heartworm preventative. The heartworm preventatives protect from the majority of our intestinal parasites. And it's really important that they get that those combination heartworm preventatives or maybe a quarterly deworming. So again, 57% think they know, but they really don't, and we can help them with that. Uh, okay, and but the thing is, a third think it's a hurdle. They feel it's a hurdle. They find it to be difficult. And so if they're not doing it, that's gonna add to the cost of care, and that's gonna add to dog owner frustration. So let's ask, how's it going with giving that med? You know, did they get it? Do you find it to be a hurdle? Why don't we just ask that question straight up? Do you find this to be a pain? Do you find this to be a hurdle? What about it is? And then maybe you can help them with finding ways for it to be less difficult. Um, sorry. Fourth. Okay. Uh, so cost of, right. So sorry. Uh, now we're coming down to going to the veterinarian, getting care for your pet. So 57% of new pet owned dog owners, that is, found they wish taking their dog to the veterinarian. Is said. Oh, more than half the pandemic dog owners said they wish taking care of their dog's health was easier and less time consuming. Now, a slightly smaller percentage felt that way before the pandemic and got a slightly higher amount after the pandemic. Only 19% said they have spoken to their vet more often during the pandemic. And that may also be because it's really hard to talk to the vet right now with uh, with, with this influx of new dog ownership and new pet ownership, and the practices have had to stagger their scheduling and stagger their staffing because if any one person gets COVID, that whole team is gonna have to isolate. And instead of shutting down the whole practice, now maybe we can at least keep half the practice open. So staffing and scheduling changes have also decreased the availability of the veterinarian or even maybe the veterinary technician to be able to communicate with the dog owner. But by and large, we have a lot, of a lot of new dog owners finding it's a pain to go to the vet with my dog. It's just difficult, he, he doesn't behave well, whatever. I don't know the in depth of it, but they wish it was easier and less time consuming. And this may also include home care, okay? If we just got a new adopted pet and he has an ear infection, if you talk to your, talk to your owners about exactly how do you get those eardrops in those ears, and you might be amazed at how much trying to chase the dog around the living room, getting him cornered behind the couch, straddling him, holding his head really tight and drop, dropping those drops in is the process. And then of course, the ear drops never get in, the ear problem comes back again or worse, somebody gets bitten because this dog is still in pain and he feels threatened. So how can we make veterinary care less time consuming and also possibly less expensive. Well, less time consuming, frankly, is go on my YouTube channel, share some of my videos that show what I'm showing in the veterinary office can be done at home for how we, let's smear the reward on the wall as you put the eardrops in. Let's use let, veterinarians, let's dispense the lidocaine, prilocaine combination creams that can be quickly wiped in the ear, go wait 15 minutes, now put the eardrops in when there's less pain, like let's think ahead, let's be proactive for how, and the technicians, you guys can do a great job at share these videos. I know we are not in a state where you can demonstrate to the client in the exam room very easily, and you might be able to over there at curbside, 
but at least to share these videos from my YouTube channel, from other YouTube channels, maybe make a handout and coach your client through it. Uh, this is where telehealth consults are awesome. If that client's saying like, I'm really struggling trying to get these eardrops in, say, you know what, let's do a 15 minute, 20 minute telehealth appointment, maybe with a veterinary technician, where she can watch the steps that you're doing and then tell you how to change it up to make it easier for your pet. And because if we can control that ear infection, we can get it treated and under control so it doesn't reoccur, or if it starts to reoccur, the client at home can now start to clean the ear, maintain the health of the ear, and decrease how often they have to come in. That's what's gonna make it less time consuming and save them money. Um, so, you know, some of the other notes on here from the study were, you know, it's really been nice to see, you know, that more people are, want, are involved in having pets. And I do, I did a program earlier this spring uh, with a shelter care veterinarian where shelter care veterinarian was really happy and excited to see how, like how well the uh, uh, like quick adoptions out into the homes were with these dogs at the start of the stay at home orders. And you know, my presentation part was, okay, let's, let's be preemptive and talk about these Many of these dogs probably have behavior problems such as separation anxiety um, or fear-based problems that may lead to aggression. So let's be preemptive. Let's help these dogs start right off the bat with establishing some good behavior and minimizing maybe some of the relapse of these things. So veterinarians and shelters and rescues and groomers and doggy daycares. I have a lot of free handouts on my website. I want you to go there and download all of them and just give them away to everybody. That's what they're there for. You don't have to ask me permission. You can put them in your newsletters. You can put them in anything you want. Just don't change them without telling me. But here is one handout that would address a lot of these problems here, especially this one, this overactivity and attention. Okay, I'm gonna focus on that because that's our biggest thing. You know what I mean? That's our biggest impact for rehoming. And it, it, it always has been. All right, I have a handout. And this kind of goes along with my uh, puppy certification program and my uh, online puppy um, housebound puppy socialization program. And while it's titled and everything for the puppy, you still do this with an adult dog. Do this with your rescue dog. So I call this a puppy pina colada because it's kind of a quick little recipe for how to have a calm, well-behaved young dog. So first of all, if we're seeing, you know, a puppy or any young dog, when I say young dog, I'm gonna talk about a dog two years of age and under, that is showing any kind of stopping, staring, avoiding, or bark, 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 barking, and something new that comes into the home. You know, these are those signs of fear and anxiety that may be actually shifting over to impulsiveness or aggression. Get that puppy on an adapto collar. This is not sponsored by SIVA or anybody. I'm not selling anything for any company. I'm telling you from my experience what consistently tends to work. And if you've got to reach for a first line product, just the first product, say do this because we've got to keep it that simple for these first time dog owners. We do not want to get into a 20 minute discussion and we, and frankly, many of you don't have the time for it. So the adaptal collar, the mother dog calming pheromone collar by SIVA, it is still the trademarked um, chemical analog to the mother dog pheromone from her breasts. All dogs still have the receptors for this pheromone, no matter what their age is. And it will help to reduce, it will help to bring some calming. Now, the more agitated the dog, the, you're gonna see you're not you're not gonna take a dog who's really agitated to totally laying still and calm think of it this way if you go to that ladder of aggression it's also on my website if we have a dog who's all the way up at bark 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 and staring and we just put the adaptive collar on we may have this dog like now looking and maybe with a lot of throwing of treats he may then turn his head away and go back to look a few times he has come down about three steps if we now have, and the point is though, he is learning and we're establishing some improvements. So you still use the adaptive collar, okay? Um, the second thing is, and this is available at PetSmart, it's available everywhere, you could get it on Chewy.com, you don't have to have a prescription. Second one, 
I personally prefer the Composure Pro supplement. And that is because it's a balance of different products in there. And the Composure Pro, Pro can be used on the young puppies. You can start that on puppies as young as eight weeks of age. If we have an extremely timid puppy or a food aggressive puppy, that is not normal puppy behavior. Those puppy needs inter need intervention immediately. Yes, they need a behaviorist, but until they get to the behaviorist, we've got to do something to help improve them immediately. So the Composure Pro is the second product. Now, the second step is any dog under two years of age needs three minutes of walking for a pound of body weight a day. Yeah, you now have a two-year-old Labrador that weighs 60 pounds. That's about 180 minutes, three hours worth of walking every day. Now, you may not be able to say, oh my gosh, you can't get all those walks in. Okay, any kind of physical aerobic activity, but they do need to get the walks. At least, at least that one minute per pound of walking and the other remaining amount could be balanced between an intense game of fetch in the yard and food puzzles that the dog has to roll around and chase around and figure out how to do. That's activity, okay? That's why many of these, no food bowls. That's my third one on this puppy pina colada. You're gonna use what's called learn to earn. We're gonna use their food for training, like come, sit, especially come away from the window, reward them. Um, the third, the fourth thing, I call this four on the floor. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see a video called Stop Jumping Up. And what this is, the only time that dog is ever petted, talked to, or touched is when all four feet are on the floor. When they go to jump up on you, you take a big step back, and as soon as the feet hit the floor, that's when you pet them. I demonstrated in the video. So just think four on the floor. That's the only time they get any attention. And then lastly, the five steps to perfect puppy potty training. I know that was not much of a complaint in here, but it still is important for our dogs to, you know, to eliminate properly. And frankly, one of the steps of the uh, perfect puppy potty training is you take them out on a leash, because guess what? Right after they urinate or defecate, you take them on that walk. It's a part of the routine, it's a part of the process. So this is a one page handout. You can download it from my website, give it to your clients. You could email it to them. You could attach it to something. You could post it on your Facebook page. But this is what helps to keep it simple and will help to resolve at least this. These other two, I know I covered that. Um, we need to ask, you know, how was it to give the medication and be ready with some solutions and also set our, set our clients up to expect that, yeah, every month you're gonna need to give this. Here's some reminders, you know, whatever, a monthly refill, things that make it easy to stay up with this. And then lastly, use some of my videos. There's other things on like the Fear Free channel, the Cattle Dog Publishing channel, lots of other places for how to, how to do less stressful care at home for ear care, nail care, um, also veterinary practices, shelter, vaccine clinics. Make sure you're using those uh, low stress handling skills, low stress care with rewards, as well as stripping down that environment so it's not so stressful for the pet. It makes it easier for the client to bring the pet in. And that ultimately really teaching them about home care is what helps to save the cost of care. Thank you everyone. Um, I think that right now at this time, if we gave every new dog owner that puppy, pe puppy pina colada handout, uh, that'd be a great starting point. Because in, in my life experience as a general practice veterinarian, very few pet owners were doing any more than one of those steps. And when they started adding in a few more of that puppy pita colada steps, problems really decreased. And satisfaction with the pet really increased. So that'll keep it simple. And um, I think there's other ways we can collaborate. I think we, I'm gonna touch on this subject and I'm gonna bring in some other you know, friends to speak as well as we go through 2021. Because I really see this issue as being a big concern for us with animal care, but we can be preemptive. We can help nip some of these problems in the bud with people. And it's gonna be, it, I think we need, to be collab we need to be collaborative with it between the dog trainers, the veterinary staff, and the shelter community. The shelter community is gonna be really important in helping to prevent the return, not by just saying, no, don't bring them back, but by establishing outreach in your community to help 
with these new dog owners. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week. I hope you're all having a good early holiday season. Stay healthy too. Bye-bye.